Our text is Acts chapter 21. We'll look at verses 27 through the end of the chapter. Um, And there's a white sheet with the outline, Paul before the mob. The mob is provoked. The mob is unreasonable. By the way, the mob is always unreasonable. That's what makes it the mob. Reason from an unexpected source, and the one that's the most important, trust in the Lord for your help. Oh, did I tell you the page number? You probably found it already. You guys are quick with your finger. You're quicker than I am. Uh, Page 931 of the Pew Bible, Acts chapter 21, verses 27. Hear again the word of the Lord. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. And moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, Word came to the tribune of the con- con- cohort that and all Jerusalem was in confusion. And at once he took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the soldiers and the tribune, they stopped beating Paul. And the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound in two chains, and he inquired who he was and what he had done, and some of the crowd were shouting one thing and some another, and he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, and he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. When he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of people followed, crying away with him. And as Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, may I say something to you? And he said, you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness? Paul replied, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city, I beg you, Permit me to speak to these people. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language. Thus far, the word of the living God. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your rule over all of your creatures and all of our actions. We ask even now, as we are present before your word, quiet before your word, that you would instruct us of your glory, instruct us not to be afraid, and instruct us to trust in you for all things, always. Through our Lord Jesus. Amen. This is a sermon for someone who has been attacked or felt attacked or felt shamed specifically about your Christian faith. If you've never had someone belittle you or come against you because of your faith, you're either very young in your faith or you're not paying attention Haven't we not all felt that? Haven't we not all known that? Now, you may not have had a mob tearing you apart, but the solution, the answer is the same. We look to the Lord our God, who not only forgives us from sin, but builds us up in Christ and uses us and supplies our needs 
and empowers us to do his will. That's right, you. You're empowered to do God's will. Well, here we have the Apostle Paul. He's come into Jerusalem. He's wanted to come into Jerusalem for quite some time, and he comes in with a reputation. He was the Apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ who fearlessly preached the Word of God, preached Christ before Jewish people, before non-Jewish people. He would go before rulers. He would preach God's Word. And he preached in the synagogues because... Those are the people that are expecting the, the Christ, the Messiah. This was their Messiah. And so they're the ones who should hear first. And he says that the gospel is for the Jew first because it, all the promises were given to them, but it's for the Greek also. It's for all, and it's the same gospel. Some received it with joy, others not so much. The leaders of the church in Jerusalem, when Paul came, were delighted to see him again and hear the work of this missionary preacher. He hadn't been sent out from Jerusalem. He was sent out from Antioch, but still they knew what was going on. And many of them, I'm sure, knew Paul from his pre-Christian days. Paul, though, had this negative reputation because when he preached the gospel, he preached to the Gentiles and told them, you do not have to become Jewish in order to follow Jesus. You do not have to observe all of the Jewish elements of circumcision and keeping a kosher table and things like that. And because of that, there was this misunderstanding that he was telling the Jewish believers that they shouldn't be Jewish, which is just not true. But it had gotten so bad that even some of the Christians in Judea were scratching their head and really wondering about this Paul fellow. Well, you were saved by grace through faith. It's not a works. It's nothing that you can do. And we're actually made into God's workmanship that he'll do good things through us because he's already prepared for us to do those. This is what Paul writes in Ephesians. And it's true. What connects you to the Savior? It's not your works. It's not your ceremony. It is faith, trust in Christ. This is Palm Sunday, especially remembering Christ's triumphal entry. And oh, that hymn that talks about not his triumphal coming and all the people with the hosannas, but the realization that this was the beginning of the greatest test and the sacrifice. God expects his... We move along through the week the rejoicing, the death, and the resurrection. Now, how often do we remember the death and resurrection of Jesus? Daily, certainly every week, that's why we gather. But we're not saved because of something we do. We're saved by Christ. Now, I could say Jesus died and Jesus rose again, and you can say, well, I believe that. And I said, what's that got to do with you? What do you say? I'm joined to Christ by faith. I receive what he's done for me by faith. And now I'm a new person. And you do. You have the Holy Spirit with you. Praise the Lord. He wanted to make sure that no one was misunderstanding, thinking that you're going to have to trust in Christ and do all these other things. Leaders of the church in Jerusalem said, we've got an idea how you can demonstrate that you are not against being Jewish. There was a sacrifice going on, and there, he's in the midst of this. In fact, it's like the seventh day, I think, when we were, we were picking out up in our reading. He had done a, a vow before himself. Uh, this is not out of character for him. So did this plan work? That people would see him doing this very Jewish thing and think, oh, he's not against the temple? And I said last week, I said, yes and no. I think to the church of Jesus, it was demonstrated that, yes, he's not against the things of the temple, but to those who were not for Jesus, those who looked at Paul and viewed him as the enemy, not just because of anything he might do against Jewishness, but because he's preaching Jesus and they were against Jesus for him 
no, this would not correct anything. They would still continue to oppose him. They had this false understanding, yes, but even if there wasn't that understanding, they were against Paul. So, the first point here, the mob is provoked. Paul's faced mobs before. Uh, In Ephesus, the silversmiths were all up in an uproar because they were making the little silver idols and people weren't picking up the idols anymore because they were not going to the temple and worshiping idols, praise the Lord, but not good for their business. And the Lord protected Paul and even the leaders of the city said, nah, don't come out into this. Let's make sure that you're okay and we don't need more problems. So he understood this. And here we have another mob that's formed. Let's look again at the text. The seven days were almost completed. That's this this vow that the other people were taking and Paul was purifying himself as well. Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place, the temple. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. Well, that was not true, but verse 29, they'd previously seen uh, Trophius the Ephesian with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Now, these were Jews from Asia, probably Ephesus. They probably knew this Trophius because he was from Ephesus. All the people, as Paul had brought the gift to help the church in Jerusalem, all the different cities, they had representatives to come. And so there they were. So when they saw Paul and they saw uh, this other fellow, Trophius, that they were on the lookout how they could grab him, and there was Paul in the temple. They were distressed, they thought. They also took advantage of an attitude that people had toward the temple. The temple in Jerusalem was the place where God had set his name. Of all the places, this is where God had placed his name, and they knew that God was with them because this was the place of his presence. They were the people of God because of the temple, and that's how they looked at it. This was the place they came to make prayers. This was the place they came for sacrifices. This was the holy place. They traveled from all over, not just Judea or the Levant, but all over the, in the, what they call the diaspora, all those Jews out there, they would come here. And they did come there because that was the place. Now, our Old Testament reading was from the, from the prophet Jeremiah. By the way, Jeremiah had a tough assignment, very tough assignment. Like many of the prophets, though, he was called to tell the people to repent to show them what they're doing is not right. And if they didn't repent, there'd be judgment. Sometimes judgment was a famine. Sometimes it was oppression by an army. But here, he told the people, if they do not repent, God's judgment will come on this city, on this place, on this house, this temple, and it will be destroyed. It will be removed. And they heard that. They said, wait a minute. You're speaking against the temple of God. They were ready to put him to death. Jesus had a unique experience in the temple on this last week before the crucifixion. You might recall he goes in and he sees all the buyers and sellers of the animals and he uh, takes the, the, the little tables where they have all the accountant and the money and upturns them. He braided a whip and he drove them out and then he begins to calmly teach. They were not really happy about his disruption of the temple, and yet they knew that he was right. They'd made it a house of business, even a den of thieves, because they oppressed the poor people who were coming to worship. But you remember, too, in John chapter 4, where Jesus goes and speaks to the Samaritan woman, and she says, I realize you're really, you're really a prophet, And she asks him this question. Are we supposed to worship in that temple like you Jews say? Or is it okay for us to worship on this mountain like our patriarchs patriarchs said? And and when she, she said that, it's like 
are you guys right or are we right? I really want to know. I really want to know if I'm being right here. And Jesus said, look, yeah, the Jews have it right because that's where the word of God actually says. But look, the time is coming and now is. It's not in this house or that temple or this mountain. But people will worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Even now. By the way, we sometimes call this room a sanctuary. You know what makes it a sanctuary? We do. God's presence is here with his people. We come and gather to worship in spirit and in truth. And by the way, it's kind of nice to have a place you're used to coming because you come with that attitude. I come with that attitude of worship. It becomes holy because of worship. Well, that attitude toward the temple, this is the place of God. You can't say anything against the place of God. That was what they had with Jeremiah. They were ready to put him to death. Fortunately, in that time, the officials, when they heard this, said, no, we don't think so. The mob, which even had some of the priests and religious leaders for Jeremiah, were quieted, and properly so. But here, the mob forms, verse 30, all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together and seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut, the temple area. There's a large area that was up there, and they got him out of the temple area proper, and they wanted to just kill him. But as in Ephesus, the civil power would use its authority appropriately to restore order. Well, the second point here is that the mob is unreasonable. He, Paul was in a deadly situation, and he had no defense. He couldn't fight his way out of it. He couldn't talk his way out of it. They were there, and they are going to beat him to death. This wasn't even an official stoning where they'd say, well, let's bring out who are the witnesses to cast the first stone. They were just going to act as a mob and kill this man. And the Lord rescues Paul by the hands of the Roman authority. Verse 31, as they were seeking to kill him, the word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. There's a riot in the city. And this man who was over the barracks, this person who was over centurions and soldiers, wasted no time. He didn't send somebody else down. He went himself. And they hurried down. They come running down even because they know how the situation can get out of hand in a heartbeat. And his job is to keep order. Verse 32, he took soldiers and centurions, those are the ones over the soldiers, ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Why did they stop beating Paul? Because the law had arrived. And they knew they weren't doing a good thing. Nobody wants to be arrested. The tribune saw that Paul was at the center of this. What do you do? Well, let's arrest him. And he even assumed something more about him that wasn't true. His main job was to stop the mob, quiet the mob, pull this guy out aside, and then deal with this guy and figure out what's going on. He asked for reasons, and none of it comes back. You know, they're shouting one thing. They're shouting another thing. And so he says, let's get Paul out of this. He orders them into the barracks. That was his job. There's a riot forming. Stop the riot. Isn't it a great thing when the civil governor knows his job and does it? When there's a riot, we stop the riot. It's important. And Romans, you know what they were known for? Roman law, law and order. Let's keep things neat and in order. Some of them might have become good Presbyterians. I don't know. (laughs) He thought that he might settle the crowd, but when he was taking them away, verse 35, they came to the steps. He was actually, he, Paul, actually carried up the steps because of the crowd. And the mob said, away with him. Away with him isn't just get him out of our sight. Away with him means kill him kill him. This is what they said about Jesus. What should we do with Christ? Crucify him. Away with him. 
and later say he's worthy of death. He didn't have a reason to arrest him. The tribune did not, but he needed to get him aside, get him away. Well, the third point here, reason from an unexpected source. No reason in the mob. Where's the reason that's unexpected, at least to me? It comes from, well, Paul would have been reasonable if someone would have listened to him, but you have to have people listen to you if you're going to be reasonable with them. But there's reason coming from this Roman official. You know, there's, there's, there's no understanding in this Roman about Jewish matters, but he does know that they can get pretty excited, and he quells that. So picture this. Paul is being extracted from the mob physically, even carried up the steps. And as this is going on, he turns to the tribune, and he says this in verse 37. May I say something to you? And the response is, you speak Greek? I mean, if... if Paul was not just saying Greek was a common language. Everybody would speak Greek in a sense. It was the trade language. But it was though Paul had said to him, excuse me, would it be permissible if I could just have a word with you? And the guy looks at him. He says, you speak good Greek. Who are you? You're not the person I thought you were. In fact, he thought he was this fellow who had... uh, led this, the Egyptian led this revolt, this assassins, and had an attack and thought maybe he was back. And that was the reason that he did this. Why else would these people be so upset at this guy? There's another really good mark against this Roman official. Nobody wants to be told that they're wrong, and this is what he thought, and all of a sudden he finds out he wasn't right at all. He, he didn't know who this guy was. He was right to stop the, the mob. That, that was his job. He got that. When Jeremiah was preaching in the temple, saying this temple will be destroyed if you don't repent, those people did not want to hear that they were doing wrong. You know what, dear ones? None of us like to hear that we're doing wrong. And you know what, dear ones? We all need to be told when we're doing wrong, and we need to have hearts to listen. What a gift repentance is. What a gift even an open heart is. If people would be quick to question themselves, as quick to question themselves as they are to question other people, things would be a lot calmer. Anyway, realizing you're wrong is a sign of God's grace. By the way, when I do marriage, premarital counseling, I do tell them about the nine magic words. The nine words. You think, oh, the three words, I love you. No, no, no. I was wrong. I am sorry. Please forgive me. These are words we should be saying a lot. Do you know why? Because a lot, you are wrong. And you should be sorry and communicate that and ask for forgiveness. And if they don't forgive you, you know what? Give them time. That's their job. May God give that grace to all of us. Back to the tribune here. You know, are you that, that Egyptian who recently stirred up and led a revolt of 4,000 men of the assassins into the wilderness? Aren't you that same troublemaker who was here a little while ago? I thought that's why they're treating you so roughly. And he says, no, I'm a Jew from Tarsus. In Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. He's a Jew. He has perfect right to be in the temple. As you remember, he even purified himself before he was going in there, part of this. I'm from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no obscure city. Tarsus is one of the oldest continually inhabited cities in the world. They can see this going back farther and farther. And it was the Roman regional capital in that area of Asia Minor, just as Ephesus was in its area. That was the place that the Romans set their base, and so the people there had citizenship in Rome. Now later, he's going to make it very explicit that he's a Roman citizen. If the tribune was 
catching on, he should have realized that even when he says from where he's from, no obscure city in the Roman Empire. See, there are inscriptions in Rome today, S-P-Q-R, and it talks about, this is in the name of the Senate and the, the people of Rome, the Roman citizens, the Senate and the citizens. Paul was one of those citizens. The basis for the authority of Rome, according to that, although at this point, you know, there's a, there's, there's a, a Caesar, right? But according to that, he, he's a very important person just for that reason. We'll look at that in another day, Lord willing. He says, I, I beg you permit, to permit me to speak to the people. Again, one of the duties of the tribune is to keep people from being oppressed. And one of the things that the citizens of Rome do is to keep the people from being oppressed. I mean, that's what the officials are to do. And he's let himself known, let himself let be known that he was a Roman citizen. And so this fellow says, okay. Now, what he says, we're going to save for another time. But I do want us to think about the situation he was in and for us. And that's the last point. Trust in the Lord for your help. Paul was in Jerusalem. You know why? He thought that's where the Lord was calling him. He was going to have great trouble in Jerusalem. And he knew that because everywhere he went, the people said, by the Spirit of God, trouble's coming to you. You're going to be bound there. Trouble's going to happen to you. And he says, this is where the Lord would have me go. And he goes. Now, there are, did he do anything wrong? No. He didn't mistreat the temple. He didn't do anything wrong. You will have times when you will be opposed, oppressed, in other ways, when you've done absolutely nothing wrong. Why is that? We live in a sinful world. Sin's everywhere. And you're, it hurts people. Sometimes it's going to hurt you. Often, it's your own sin that hurts you. Fair enough, me too. But sometimes it's the sin of other people. Sometimes it's not because of your fault or your foolishness, but things beyond your control. When it happens, don't be surprised. It happens to Paul. He shouldn't have been surprised because they told him, told him it was coming. It happened to Peter. It happened to the Lord Jesus. Was he opposed? Yes. Was he guilty? No. Christ, who knew no sin, though became sin for us. It was sin that made this happen. When you know that you will suffer persecution, all who would live godly in Jesus will suffer persecution in one way or another. Don't be surprised. Peter writes, we should obey all the ordinance of men that do not violate the law of God. Paul says the same things in Romans. Obey the civil magistrate. If you're punished for doing wrong, well, you're punished for doing wrong. If you're going to be punished, at least let it be for not doing wrong because then you are suffering even the sufferings that Christ suffered. You are a part of that. So, if someone could be a big thing, it could be a little thing. You can lose your job, you can lose a friend. When people are rejecting the gospel, they're rejecting Christ. Pray for them. Continue to love them. Sometimes, though, people aren't going to be reasonable with you. The mob wasn't reasonable. And there's no reasoning with the mob. Sometimes even an individual, there's no reasoning. Trust then in the Lord who is in charge, who will do what is right and what is good. The Lord always does what's good. It's not always pleasant. But God's good purposes are still there. How do you know? Because you trust him. That's what the word says. Well, how do we know it's true? Because we believe it. And then we do see it, sometimes sooner than later. Eventually, we know always, though, that God is good, that he brings relief. And sometimes he brings it by unexpected means. 
Who would have thought that Paul was going to bring rescue through a Roman official? Seriously? This guy doesn't understand any of these things. And yet, this is what God used. It's not the first time that the officials have been helpful for Paul. The Lord will bring sometimes uh, help through an unexpected source. What do you do? You thank him for it. And recognize that the help is from the Lord through that source. Okay, now you've all heard that story about the person trapped on the roof and the flood was coming and it got higher and higher and someone said, you come with us and they don't go. And later somebody comes by in a boat saying, hey, you know, the water's getting high and they're up on the roof. Says, no, I'm, I'm trusting in the Lord. I prayed for the Lord to, to deliver me. And uh, then the helicopter comes by and says, no, I'm not going, I'm trusting in the Lord. To, and then it gets higher and higher and the person drowns in, in heaven. Okay, this is just a story, people. He asked the Lord, well, I prayed for you to, to rescue me. Why, why didn't you rescue me? He says, I sent the boat. I sent the helicopter. I sent the weather forecast. Okay, that, that's a silly story. But you get the point. God uses all these things. What is out there that God hasn't made? Nothing. In fact, God made everything out of nothing. The Lord does that, except the Lord's help always. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Do we go forward with confidence even in difficult situations? The answer is yes, because our help is in the name of the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. He will provide. He will rescue from those who would slander you, those who would attack you, those who would undermine you. But the main thing we need is not just relief at that moment. We need the relief that God gives us that is eternal. And that is forgiveness of sin. That is true today. And that is true forever. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. O oh Lord, indeed, we do trust that all that you do is right and that you have us in your hands. Even as our Lord said, no one is able to take us out of your hands as we trust in Christ. Again, Lord, we, we pray for those who wander without that sureness and security, that you would open their hearts to know the glory and the love and the joy of trusting in Christ and that you would draw them to yourself. For each heart to say, I, I now trust in Christ. I'm not looking for my own plan, my own way, but will receive what God has given. And Lord, even as we have done that, that we would continue to look to you always and only for our rescue and our help, not our money or our cleverness or our ability or our influence, but to know that you are the one who provides, you are the one who protects, you are the one who leads, you are the one who preserves. Give us hearts to be grateful as we see all of the ways that you lead us, protect us, and guide us. Thank you for joy in this journey through Christ.